stand one more time and turn with me to Mark chapter 16. We have uh, been for a couple of months now making our way through Mark's gospel beginning in chapter 1, and today we're going to skip all the way to the end. So Mark chapter 16, and we're going to read the first eight verses. Mark says, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb, and they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, They saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. You'll notice, probably in your Bibles, that there is a note there that says some of the earliest manuscripts do not include Mark 16, 9 through 20, which is the rest of Mark's gospel. And there's actually a good case to be made that Mark's gospel ends there at verse 8, and that that's the end of what Mark himself had written. And we're going to treat it uh, that way. I'm not going to go through all the reasons why, and I still think the rest of it is scripture. I just uh, think there's a good case that Mark himself didn't write those last verses, and he ended there in that strange place with the women running away in fear. wonder why that is. You can be seated. <clears throat> Excuse me. You may remember some weeks ago when we began our study of Mark's gospel that Mark wastes no time getting to the point and telling us what his purpose is in writing his gospel. In the very first verse, he states the case that he intends to make, and he says, this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ the Son of God, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we looked at that first verse, I pointed out that Mark actually has borrowed that statement from an announcement of the birth of Caesar Augustus, the Roman emperor that was the emperor during the time when Jesus himself was born. Caesar's birth was announced to the entire Roman Empire as a euangelion, a gospel, a world-changing event that would forever change the course of human history for the good. But the case that Mark is making in his gospel is that it is not Caesar, the leader of the Roman Empire, but Jesus, the humble rabbi from Galilee, whose life and death is the true euangelion, the true good news that changes everything. And so everything that Mark has written in his gospel has been leading up to the account at the end of his death on a Roman cross, which we observed on Good Friday, and his resurrection from the dead, which we celebrate today, and read about in those last eight verses of his gospel. And it's these two events, both his death and his resurrection, which 
set Jesus apart, not only from Caesar, but from every other person that has ever walked the earth. These two events together are the center of the euangelion, the gospel of Jesus Christ. History changing, life changing, good news. So as we celebrate Jesus' resurrection from the dead today, it's important that we take a few moments to also reflect on his death and what it means. As we gathered on Good Friday, we heard again the account of how in spite of all the evidence that Jesus had given them by the miracles that he had performed and all the conversations that he had had with them, answering their questions and responding to their skepticism and their objections. The Jewish religious authorities ultimately rejected Jesus' claim that he was the Messiah that God had sent to deliver the Jewish nation and indeed the whole world. And so they conspired to have him killed. So he was arrested under the cover of darkness, and he was subjected to a sham trial. And the the trial itself, the outcome, was already determined before the trial ever started. They wanted to condemn him to death, and that's exactly what they did. And then they took him to Pilate, the Roman governor, and they insisted that Pilate put Jesus to death as an enemy of Rome even though Pilate himself recognized that Jesus was innocent of the charge that they were leveling against him. But Pilate conceded. So Jesus was beaten beyond recognition. He was marched through the streets of Jerusalem to the place called the Place of the Skull, which is the place just outside the city where people were executed And for six hours, he hung on a Roman cross, enduring unimaginable suffering as he was mocked and cursed and spit upon until finally he surrendered his life. That's certainly a heartbreaking, shocking, gruesome event. But certainly not the only gruesome death that took place in Palestine under the cruel hand of Roman occupation. And Jesus was certainly not the only man to have been falsely accused or to lose his life as a result of a gross injustice. So why, as uh, has been asked a couple times already this morning, why 2,000 years later do we still stop what we're doing on Good Friday in order to ponder the death of this man? Why is his death so important? To answer that question, we need to go back to the very beginning of human history. So put your seatbelts on. We're going through all of human history. The ham can wait. I'm kidding. You know how brief I am. But the opening chapters of the Bible in the book of Genesis tell us that when God created humanity, his purpose in creating human beings was to share himself with them to share his own goodness with them, to share his joy with them in a relationship that he invited them into that would be based not on fear, but on love, on the reciprocity of affection and intimacy and love. But love is not love without the freedom not to love. Does that make sense? Love is not love without the freedom not to love. So God gave them the freedom to obey 
or not to obey, to trust or not to trust, to return his love for them or to reject him. And tragically, Scripture tells us the first humans did reject God. Rather than trusting him, they chose to go their own way. Rather than returning his love, they rebelled against him. And the implication of that is the significant thing, because having rejected the very source of life, they, in effect, cut themselves off from life. And so history has unfolded from that catastrophic beginning, generation after generation of the human race following the way of Adam, living and dying estranged from God, cut off by his own doing, from the giver of life. I would suggest that deep down, we are all aware of that truth. We know fundamentally there is something deeply wrong, not only with the world that we live in, but with us. Millions around the world turn to religion in an attempt to get at what is it that is wrong and how can I fix it. Others put their hopes in the promises of politicians who promise to give us a beautiful, perfect world. Yeah. Others fill their lives with entertainment, hoping to distract themselves from those haunting questions. Still others hope to fix themselves by becoming somebody or something else. And most of us demand to be told there's nothing wrong with us. You're okay. I'm okay. You're okay. We're all okay. Cuckoo ka But it's all a vain attempt to convince ourselves. But for all of our striving, we have found no remedy to the gnawing reality that our world and we ourselves are deeply broken. The prophet Isaiah aptly describes our situation in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 6. He says, we all like sheep have gone astray. We, and here's the issue. We have turned every one of us to our own way. And as a result, like sheep that abandon the shepherd and wander off on their own, we are helplessly and hopelessly lost. And because we have turned away from the giver of life, we find ourselves without life, like a branch cut off from a tree. The leaves may still be green, but there is no life left. And we are helpless to undo what we have done. Well, say Isaiah goes on a few chapters later in chapter 59, verses 9 through 13, to say, So there is no justice among us, and we do not know how to do what is right. We look for light, but find only darkness. We look for bright skies, but walk in gloom. Like the blind, we grope along a wall, feeling our way like people without eyes. Even at brightest noontime, we stumble as though it were dark. Among the living, we are like the dead. We look for justice, but it never comes. We look for salvation, but it is far from us. For our sins are piled up before God and testify against us. We know we have rebelled and have denied the Lord. We have turned our backs 
on our God. But here is the amazing twist in the tragic story. Though through the ages humanity has persistently refused to return God's love, he has never stopped loving us. Though we have rejected him, he has refused to reject us. And here is the really amazing thing. Though we had brought the calamity of death upon ourselves, he has chosen to take our death upon himself. He chose to accept the consequences of our rejection and offer himself to die so that we could live. He chose to take our death upon himself and give us his life. So the prophet Isaiah says, yes, we all like sheep have gone astray, We have all turned to our own way, but the Lord has laid our sin on him. He was pierced for our transgressions. His body was broken for our sins. He bore the consequences of our rebellion, and by his wounds we are healed. And that is what the death of Jesus was all about. The eternal creator God, God the Son, chose to become a man so that he could die our death so that we could live. And as he breathed his last breath, Scripture says, the skies grew dark and the earth convulsed under the weight of grief and suffering. Not our grief, but God's grief like a black hole pulling everything into itself, our creator pulled the full weight of human misery and suffering into himself, canceling it all by that one act of divine love and grace. And then there was silence. They laid him in a stone tomb, cut into a hillside, and they rolled a big stone across the entrance. And by all appearances, life seemed to return to normal as though nothing had happened. But in reality, the world would never be the same again, because death was about to be swallowed up by life. So it was, Mark tells us, that when the Sabbath was over, several women made their way to Jesus' tomb, hoping to give the care to his body that they hadn't been able to give a couple of days before because the Sabbath was coming and they weren't allowed to attend to him. As they made their way to the tomb, they realized that in their grief they had failed to consider the very large stone that sealed the tomb and that they themselves could not possibly hope to move. But undaunted, they continued on, hoping that they might find help when they arrived. And when they arrived, they found that the stone had already been rolled away. And when they entered the tomb, Jesus' body wasn't there. Instead, an angel was seated on the stone slab where Jesus' body should have laid. And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen. See the place where they laid him. And he went on to instruct them to take a message to the disciples, to tell them that Jesus had risen, just as he said he would, and that they were to journey to Galilee, and he would go, and he would meet them there. But the women were so afraid, Mark says, that they ran away and they didn't tell anyone. And that's where, as I noted earlier, Mark's original gospel most likely comes to an end. Seems like an odd place to end, doesn't it? 
with the women running away in fear, so confused by what they had heard and seen that they just didn't have plans to tell anyone about it. We do know from the other Gospels that they actually did recover their wits, and they did go and tell the disciples the news. And Peter and John ran to the tomb, and they found it empty, just as the women had said. And they, too, then were very confused. And we know that Jesus himself appeared to Mary Magdalene because Mary had followed Peter and John to the tomb. And he also appeared to two of his followers later that day as they walked along the road to Emmaus. And then that evening, he went to the disciples where they were hiding in the upper room. But if Mark has ended his gospel at verse 8, as is likely, then he chose not to tell us any of that, just to leave us with the women running away in fear. And the question is, why? One answer, and I think it's a good one, is that he intended to leave us with the fear and confusion of the women in order to help us grasp how totally unexpected Jesus' resurrection was. So much so that his closest followers had a hard time believing it, even though he had told them on numerous occasions that that's exactly what was going to happen. He was going to Jerusalem. He was going to be rejected by the elders of Israel. He was going to be betrayed and crucified, but he would rise again. All of that went right over their heads. And when Jesus was crucified, they all thought it was the end. The two men that Jesus met on the road to Emmaus, I think, really express the despair and disappointment that they all felt. They said, we had hoped that he was the one. We had hoped. I suppose we can imagine a different scenario where they trusted Jesus so completely like all of us would have, right? And were unfazed by his death. So perhaps we can picture them handing out flyers, you know, on on Saturday. Come to the tomb Sunday morning. You will be amazed at what you see. Maybe even Matthew could have got his tax collector booth out again and sold some tickets, raised some revenue. But all four Gospels are unanimous in telling us that wasn't the case. Every one of Jesus' followers were absolutely shattered by his death. The women were actually the bravest of them all because they at least came out of hiding and went to the tomb. But they had gone there with the intention of anointing his body because they assumed he was dead and that he was going to stay dead. Mark wants us to feel their confusion and despair because it's their initial unbelief that makes their later testimony so believable. Overnight, the disciples went from hiding themselves away in fear to boldly proclaiming that Jesus had risen. And they were all willing to face death themselves rather than change their testimony. And all but John did die for their testimony, and John himself was put in prison. So why? What changed? The most plausible answer is what John said at the opening of his first letter in 1 John. He said, we saw him with our own eyes. We touched him with our own hands, and we heard his voice with our own ears. And so, having experienced, having witnessed Jesus raised from the dead, they realized that Jesus had conquered the grave, and death no longer held any fear for them. No amount of persecution 
or intimidation could persuade them to say that they hadn't seen what they knew very well and most certainly had seen. They were absolutely certain that Jesus had risen from the dead and they died proclaiming it because that changed everything for them. And they recorded their testimony for us so that we too may believe and by believing put our trust in him and be restored to the life that we forfeited when we turned away from God. Several implications as we close. First, one of the things that the resurrection does is it confirms that everything Jesus said about himself was true. And what that means, it means a lot of things, but the thing I want to point out, what that means is that God the eternal son became a human being and suffered and died for you and me. God did that for you because he loves you. What greater expression of love can we possibly imagine than that? What a great expression of love that a man would die for a man, but that the creator would die for us. You may be here today or be watching and feel unloved. Perhaps you've been betrayed or hurt by someone that you trusted. Perhaps you've been taken advantage of or you feel invisible. Perhaps it's you that's failed and you don't feel like you deserve to be loved. Perhaps you find it difficult to love yourself. There is one who loves you with a love that is beyond comprehension. And his love for you is steadfast and true. And he has already proved that there is nothing you could do that would cause him to love you less and nothing you need to do to get him to love you more. All you need to do is to accept his love, believe it, and entrust yourself to it. Second implication By his resurrection, Jesus has defeated death itself. And he has demonstrated that he has the power to give life to any and all who put their trust in him. As Jesus said to Martha before he raised her brother Lazarus from the dead, he said, as Jeff read earlier, I am the resurrection and the life Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Jesus has broken the chains of death forever. And in so doing, he has transformed our mourning into dancing and our despair into joy. The prison gates have been thrown open and all we have to do is walk through them and live in the life that he died and rose to give us. Finally, with Jesus' resurrection, the great reversal of all things has begun. And just as he reversed the effects of death and emerged from the grave to a new and indestructible life, the book of Revelation ends with his own promise, Behold, 
I am making all things new. And though the world is still full of evil, and it may seem that evil will overwhelm us, evil is in fact being pushed back one heart at a time until the day of his return in triumph when, as Isaiah says, the whole earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And all that is wrong will be made right. All that is broken will be restored. And as Julian of Norwich said, all things, all things, all manner of things will be well. And just as he is reversing the tide of evil in our world, he can reverse that tide in you too. Regardless of where you have been or what you have done, he can make you new. Whatever burden of failure and regret you're carrying, Your life need not be defined by it any longer. You can be forgiven and released from the prison of guilt and regret. Again, the doors have been thrown wide open. All we need to do is walk through them, trusting that Jesus can do for us what we can't do for ourselves. He can give us a new heart and bring our soul back to life. So the angel sent the message from Jesus to the disciples. Meet me in Galilee. Think about the message and what it required of them. It required of them to leave their room where they were hiding in fear. It required of them to step out and go forward. And Jesus offers us all the same invitation. Join me. Leave the room where you've been hiding. Leave your prison of disbelief and fear and guilt and regret and come and join me in this new life that I now live. Jesus said, I came that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly filled to the rim and pouring over more than you can contain. If you're a believer, I pray that that abundant life defines your life and that today is a day of joy and gratitude for the life that he has given us. And if you've never put your faith in Christ, today is the day. The prison doors are open. Walk through them. Take hold of life. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the life that you have given us, that you paid so dearly to give us. What love. What amazing love. I pray that that love will cause each of us to respond, to want to come near, to leave whatever prison holds us, whatever room we're hiding in, and join you in your life. We ask this, Father, in Jesus' name, the name of the risen Savior, Stand with me. Isaiah 9 tells us of the increase of his government and his peace.
there will be no end. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish it. Hallelujah. 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 For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, for the Lord God of Nepotence reigneth. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. The kingdom of this world is beyond the kingdom of our joy and the life of the risen Christ. Amen. Amen. God bless you as you go.